Uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone, and welcome to this online uh, policy dialogue on climate change, nationalism and the state, a realist approach. Uh, this event today is uh, jointly organized by the European uh, Policy Center and by the King uh, Baudouin Foundation under its Connecting for Climate uh, initiative. Uh, for those that don't know me, my name is Ricardo Borges de Castro. I'm the Associate Director and Head of Europe in the World Program here at, um, at the EPC. Uh, today's event um, happens at the moment uh, where the world has received basically code red from the United Nations. Um, the latest IPCC report uh, on climate change says that climate change is widespread, rapid, and intensifying. So um, really, we are at a moment where um, all actions and all ideas that can be brought to the table to discuss how to tackle this issue are, are important. We are also a few days, a short few days away from, uh, from COP26. Uh, uh, so we really, this is a, the, the right moment. And we thought both uh, the European Policy Center and the King Baudouin Foundation, that this was really a moment that we are at the moment that all ideas, all views should be, should be discussed, should be debated as a contribution to, to, to fight, uh, to fight uh, climate change. So today I, I'm really delighted to be joined by a stellar uh, panel um, of speakers uh, to discuss climate change, nationalism, and the role of the nation state uh, uh, in fighting it. Uh, so first, I'd like to, to, to welcome uh, Anatole um, uh, Levin. He's a senior fellow at the uh, Quincy um, Institute uh, for Responsible Statecraft at uh, Washington, D.C., and he's also the author of uh, Climate Change and the Nation State, The Realist uh, Perspective. This, this is, the, the, I believe, the European uh, title of the book, I find that the American version has, is a more suggestive title, which says the case for nationalism in a warming world. So this is the subtitle of, of the book. Uh, so I thought that this, uh, I, I would bring this, uh, this up because I believe that this issue is going to be relevant uh, for our discussion. Uh, so welcome, Anatole. I'm also joined by, by Heather Grabe. Uh, she's director of Open Society European Policy Institute here in, uh, in, uh, in Brussels. And, and Heather has, has, is doing a lot of work on climate change, has a I know a personal and professional concern about, about this topic. So it's, uh, we are really delighted uh, to, to have you uh, with us. And last but not least, uh, we have our, our own uh, EPC, uh, Annika Hedberg, uh, who's the head of uh, sustainable, uh, sustainable, sustainable Prosperity for Europe program here at, at, at the EPC. And I know that Annika spends a lot of time uh, thinking about, I mean, not only climate change, but sustainability and the issues uh, that, uh, of course, are related to, to, to global warming and, and also, I mean, to environmental degradation and uh, biodiversity. So she's really, she spends a lot of her time uh, thinking about this. Uh, so, um, so I think we have a really uh, a good, a good group of, 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 of speakers to, to help us think through uh, these problems. And then before I, I pass the floor to Anatole, I just wanted to give a little bit of, of um, housekeeping rules for everybody. So our session will last uh, 75 minutes. Um, we will start um, uh, with remarks by Anatole. Uh, he will have up to 25 minutes to, to put forth his, his, uh, his argument his ideas, uh, and then I will call um, um, I'll call Heather and Annika to respond uh, to 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 what uh, to 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 Anatole's um, um, sort of views, and then we will have a short conversation among ourselves, and then I will bring uh, um, uh, the the audience uh, to to the screen. Uh, so I'd like to ask you to, if you want, you can start right away uh, um, writing your questions in the in the Q and A box. Uh, do them shortly so I can read them at the glance. Or if you actually want to be part of the screen, uh, just raise your hand, and I'll ask uh, my colleagues to 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 really to give you the the the, the floor and that you that that you can and that you can speak. So Anatole, um, uh, welcome. Uh, since you since you really since you published your book, there's been a lot of interest uh, about this book. I think I mean more than 165 uh, um, persons uh, uh, you know signed up for register for uh, for today's today's event. And I think that in a town that hosts probably the most successful international regional organization that combines, you know, uh, intergovernmental and supranational features, I think your ideas are very are very interesting. And so we are really, really uh, looking forward to, to, to listening to you. So I'll, I'll give you the screen, Anatole, um, please uh, go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much. And thank you for inviting me. It's a, it's a great honor to, to speak uh, at this forum. Uh, Yes, well, so briefly to describe my book, it's not about the science of climate change. I take the science of climate change as a given. Uh, frankly, uh, I think that it would be completely irrational and, you know, different from our approach or a sensible approach to any other issue to doubt the basic scientific analysis. 
uh, of climate change, uh, as expressed you know, by the scientific consensus through the IPCC. Um, and uh, so my book is really about um, what to do about climate change, but most importantly, how to mobilize uh, elite and public support for radical action against climate change. First and foremost, of course, in the Western democracies, uh, and the book does, of course, have a particular argument directed at the United States, uh, but also more widely, uh, because, uh, of course, we, we must recognize uh, that uh, while um, countries in, in Asia are not, of course, in any way historically responsible for this problem. I mean, that is very much us. Uh, China is now the largest emitter, and also together with India, um, the country where uh, emissions are rising most rapidly now. So uh, my book stems from two propositions, um, both of which I think are generally accepted, though um, not necessarily followed through is the problem. The first, uh, and I'd make this case very strongly uh, to the uh, international security community or the Western security community from which I myself stem, uh, is that climate change is the greatest threat, not only to humanity in general over the next century and more, uh, but also specifically to our Western countries. Um, and here, you know, once again, I, I speak as a realist um, with the, uh, and I re regarding the interests of states and of course the populations of those states uh, as the principal element in international affairs. Um, the second proposition, which I fear probably we would all have to agree with, uh, is that so far and at present, uh, we are failing uh, adequately to reduce emissions, um, uh, at least if the warnings of the IPCC uh, are, are accurate, then we are failing. And if present trajectories continue, uh, then temperatures will rise by more than three degrees by the end of this century. Now, of course, this will not only lead to, if it happens, God forbid, uh, to an intensification uh, of the damage that we already see happening. I mean, this is not theoretical. You know, we see already, um, uh, you know, the wildfires, uh, heat waves, um, increased flooding, uh, and very definite, though early signs of the desertification of the entire Mediterranean region, everything that that would mean for the future of Europe, um, and of course, North Africa as well. Uh, but of course, as we all, also all know, there is a real, though naturally not quantifiable, risk uh, of tipping points and feedback loops, whereby three degrees will turn into four degrees, four degrees into five degrees. Uh, and at that point, uh, modern civilization will collapse if this happens over a fairly short space of time, even the space of a few de decades. Um, there is even, I mean, a certain possibility of the end of humanity itself. Uh, and um, it should be noted in this regard uh, that um, because they are based on consensuses, uh, the warnings of the IPCC, perhaps they are exaggerated, but perhaps um, they are actually considerably too restrained and moderate in this regard. So we, we have um, truly dire threats to humanity in general, uh, but also uh, to our countries. Now, in this regard, it must also be noted that while physical threats that threaten the very existence of states, you know, that threaten state collapse and social meltdown, uh, will not occur directly to the West um, in the next few generations, probably, can't say for, for sure, of course. They will occur in other parts of the world, uh, other parts of the world where temperatures are already you know, not too far off from the limits of human survivability or work outside in summer. I would direct people's attention to reports by the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, amongst other places, which warn of this uh, in South Asia, in the Persian Gulf, uh, where uh, there is al that already uh, severe levels of water stress. 
uh, and also, of course, where states are simply weaker and poorer and are suffering from a range of other issues. Uh, because, as has often been remarked, as the Pentagon itself uh, has noted, climate change uh, can act not just through its direct effects, but also as a threat multiplier. It can uh, you know, exacerbate other existing problems, conflicts over access to water of the kind we see um, in a number of different places in Africa. Uh, Food, the, a rise in food prices leading to mass discontent, leading to rebellion and civil war, as we saw in Syria, and so forth and so on. Now, among these vulnerable countries, uh, where the effects of climate change will become dire, or the indirect effects on society will become dire, not in the next century, but already by the middle of this century, are to be numbered India and the other countries of South Asia, where, of course, uh, more than a quarter of the world's population lives, uh, and Western Africa, including Nigeria, which it is estimated will have a population of uh, around 400 million people by the middle of this century. So we, we are talking about elsewhere in the world, um, uh, existential threats to states and societies, which uh, if we do not act radically, to limit climate change will kick in while certainly younger people alive today will still be alive, possibly not even old, only, only middle-aged. So, you know, th this is not some theoretical distant danger. And as far as Western societies are concerned, I mean, there will of course be very unpleasant direct effects. They're already happening, they will get worse. Uh, but um, there will also be massive indirect effects. And here, uh, I have to say, um, we have to identify migration. Uh, but of course, not necessarily migration itself, but migration and the reaction against migration in our own societies uh, as uh, a really dire threat to Western liberal democracy. Once again, not in not next century, but in the decades to come. And you know, just as we can see um, wildfires, we can see water shortages, heat waves, floods happening today. So I'm afraid there is simply no excuse for ignoring the threat of migration or once again, reaction against migration to liberal democracy in our countries. We know this from the opinion polls, uh, which have helped to explain support for Trump in the United States. And we know this from the rise of radical right parties in Europe, the role of migration in, in driving this. And there uh, can, it seems to me, be no doubt that if you look at places from which migration is already occurring, and uh, you look at the reasons for migration in terms of poverty, water shortages, state dysfunction, uh, violence of social violence of various kinds, that there can be no reasonable doubt that climate change is going to make this worse, perhaps radically worse, you know, in, in the decades to come. Uh, so we are facing um, a, a range of dire threats, direct threats to Western societies in the further future, indirect threats in what by historical standards is actually the very near future. Now, once again, I mean, all of this is, is recognized, um, you know, if you like, formally. Uh, but I have to say, once again, as somebody who comes from the, um, the, the world of security studies, um, uh, so much of this on the part of security establishments is basically box ticking. You, you know, if, uh, less so in Europe, of course. Uh, but if you take the principal security organization, um, for which in, in which your cent Western and Central European democracies are engaged, namely NATO, it would be very hard to argue that NATO has truly prioritized climate change uh, you know, as a security threat to the West. In America, of course, still less so. Uh, and um, it is very striking um, in the United States that as soon as the Biden administration uh, began to talk of climate change as an existential threat. There was an absolute chorus of voices, again, not from the Republicans, but from Democratic 
security experts saying, oh, well, yes, this may be true in, in, in perhaps in theory at some point in future, but actually we, we must not allow this uh, to distract us from the, the true threat of China and Russia. And this is what we should really go on concentrating on. And above all, there should be um, absolutely no question of making um, concessions to China or Russia on any issue in order to gain you know, extra action from them against climate change. Now, this does not reflect prioritization of climate change as a threat. A priority, the very word priority, means something comes first. By definition, that means something else comes second. Uh, but I have to say in this regard uh, that um, it's not only our security elites um, uh, who have, in, I would say, inherited from the past a set of attitudes that makes them incapable of uh, truly prioritizing climate change. Um, but, you know, reading the program of the, 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 the German Greens, uh, where they... Um, you know, want to combine supposedly international cooperation on climate change uh, with this very, very strong language of international human rights uh, and democracy, uh, which of course um, are directed against the existing states in China and Russia, uh, and certainly do not help when it comes to trying to gain Chinese cooperation. Uh, against climate change. And also, of course, I do not say that this is the, the agenda of the Greens, but it most certainly is the agenda of the hardest line American imperialists when it comes to uh, international geopolitics. And they, of course, don't give a damn about climate change. In many cases, don't believe that it exists and certainly would, would never for one moment accept that, climate, that the threat of climate change takes priority over uh, classical. Uh, security threats. Um, I like in this regard uh, to point to, to one issue um, in particular, uh, which is these so-called islands. They're not actually islands, they're reefs and sandbanks in the South China Sea that obsess. Well, of course, I mean, first and foremost, it was extremely stupid, deeply criminally stupid of the Chinese to build military bases on these places. But I have to say the Vietnamese are no better we ignore, you know, the other people involved in these claims. Uh, but in my view, the American security establishment has also been deeply foolish to treat this as, you know, some kind of really serious international threat for the simple reason that uh, not just if we fail, uh, you know, to keep um, climate change below three degrees, but even most probably at two degrees, all these places will be underwater again in 100 years time. The issue will quite literally not exist, uh, or at the very least, they will be subject to such repeated flooding that, well, you know, if the Chinese want to pour billions and billions and billions of dollars and millions of tons of concrete into the South China Sea, um, I suppose it's their business, really. Um, go ahead, as far as I'm concerned. Or rather don't, because it's also a distraction from their action against climate change. But, you know, anyway, you know, through the prism of climate change, so many of the things that we worry about today are virtually irrelevant. And China, still more Russia, do not threaten to destroy our states. They don't even threaten to destroy our democracies. Insofar as authoritarianism is a threat to our democracies, it is because of the internal weakness of our democracies. Uh, and so in, in my book, uh, I, I try to create an argument for how to strengthen our democracies more widely, but in the process, of course, also to mobilize sufficient mass democratic support for radical action against climate change, uh, which in my view, this is, of course, particularly true in the United States, but to a lesser extent in Europe as well, uh, has to involve the creation of cross-party coalitions um, and has to involve um, winning over considerable numbers of conservative voters, at least conservative with a small C. And the reason for this is that, um, I, it, it, it seems to me, but I believe this is, you know, very well supported. We have to recognize that radical action against climate change will regard, will re require 
very considerable sacrifices. You know, the notion which is current on the left that, oh, this is only you know, a matter of a few corporations and it can be you know, easily solved by attacks on capitalism, no. Uh, we are all implicated in this, you know. Um, uh, I, I too, you know, my consumption patterns. Uh, things will have to change and major sacrifices are necessary. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, as we have seen, especially in the United States, but elsewhere as well in Australia, in Europe, uh, whenever populations have been faced with a clear request or demand to make sacrifices for the struggle against climate change, most of them have said no, or at least you have had enough people saying no uh, to cripple the effort. Uh, now, one answer to this, of course, is the Green New Deal. So the phrase that sums up this approach, and my book is written in very strong support of the Green New Deal idea, uh, which is, of course, to combine radical action to limit emissions uh, with measures of social solidarity and job creation, and to a degree, reindustrialization in a green fashion. Uh, this, I think, the need for this is, is best demonstrated of all um, in the case of France. Uh, I, of course, strongly supported President Macron's um, fuel tax. Uh, but to combine this with tax cuts for the rich uh, and without a major program and rhetoric of social solidarity and common sacrifice was politically deeply stupid uh, and led to the result we saw, the revolt of the yellow vests um, and a considerable setback uh, for uh, environmental policies in France. Uh, so social solidarity is a, is a necessity. Uh, but uh, I would say as well, when it comes to the motivation of sacrifice, and here I come to the most controversial aspect uh, of my book, um, that we do need to mobilize nationalism, or to give it a nicer sounding phrase, but for me, um, patriotism and civic nationalism, you know, obviously not ethnic nationalism, God forbid, are in effect the same thing, uh, in the service of the struggle against climate change by focusing uh, the attention of people and elite on elites on the specific threat to their states and our states to our countries and uh, this i think is not just uh, necessary um for immediate political reasons to motivate sacrifice but also because this helps to meet what has of course been universally recognized as a key problem uh, when it comes to sacrifice in the struggle against climate change, which is generational. Uh, that um, we are asking the generations of today uh, to make very real sacrifices to ward off dangers, which although they, they will kick in, as I say, uh, begin to long before younger people today are old, the truly dire physical effects will only kick in in the further future. But of course, um, here, if you focus on patriotism, on attachment to loyalty to existing nations, well then, by definition, you are concerned for the future of that nation uh, after you yourself are dead. Uh, the notion of a temporary nation is ridiculous. As I think it's Milan Kudera said, uh, human beings know that they are mortal, um, but they believe or like to believe that their nations have a certain immortality. And indeed, in terms of uh, individual human lifetimes, they do. Many of our countries have existed for a very, very long time. The whole idea of patriotism and of service, including, of course, military service, but service to the state more generally, uh, is not just about preserving the state for the present generation. It is preserving it for the future. Uh, and that is also true, of course, of civic nationalism when it comes to the preservation of our democracies, something to which uh, the American uh, political system is explicitly dedicated, but um, Europe too, um, the European Union as an institution, but also our individual democratic states. We're not just trying to preserve these, um, you know, until we're all dead, we are trying to preserve them for the future, for our, ourselves, but also, of course, as a model for humanity. So I believe that mobilizing 
nationalism. It's not, it, it is not the answer, but it is part of the answer to mobilizing populations for climate change action. Now, um, I should say uh, that this in, in no way involves hostility on my part or opposition either to international agreements, Paris Agreement, obviously, or whatever we can manage in future, to international cooperation, absolutely not, uh, or to international movements, um, whether it's Extinction Rebellion, Greater Thunberg, Friends of the Earth, uh, whatever. But um, and here I speak once again as a realist, I think we have to recognize that these international agreements, these international movements are intended to get states to act. They're intended to push, embarrass, nudge, trap, if you will, states and state governments into taking action. Uh, unfortunately, the United Nations um, has the IPCC or the Paris Agreement, have no executive powers themselves at all. And I have to say, you know, if you look not just at the present government of China or Russia, but, but at India or indeed the United States, it is extremely unlikely that the major emitters of the world will in fact sacrifice uh, their real state powers to any international institutions. Uh, and I think COVID is also an example of, of, the, of the centrality of the state. Um, of course, it would have been vastly desirable uh, if we had seen um, if, you know, much, much more effective international cooperation. It is vastly desirable uh, that Western states um, with reserves of vaccines make them available more widely to countries in the world that don't have them and so on and so forth. Uh, but on the other hand, as we saw, throughout the world. Uh, in the end, it was only states that had the power to take many of the necessary actions in terms of lockdowns, vaccination campaigns, public awareness campaigns, closing of borders, and so on. So once again, speaking as a realist, the key question is how to get states, including our states, to act. And that is what my, my book is uh, dedicated to trying in a very small way, of course, to bring about. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anatole, for, for that overview and for finishing really with uh, on that point that it's, it's about the mobilization, making states actually respond uh, to a crisis and the mobilization of, of society. I mean, like you said, uh, this is probably uh, the, the most the important challenge that we are facing, at least our generation is facing and the next generations are facing and, you were, and we are basically failing. And so that anything that can be done to, to, to mobilize action uh, and, for, as you said, for radical solutions also to, to, to address the, the, the problem, um, uh, it's, it's really sort of interesting how, how, how you present, uh, you present the, the, the argument. So thank you for that. And I, I think I will move to, to, to Heather. I mean, Heather, I know that you have, uh, as I was saying, an interest in, in climate change, that you've been looking at this also from an intergenerational uh, perspective. But you've also been throughout your life a champion for democracy, for open societies, for, for, you know, for freedom, for human rights. And many times these ideas, at least in Europe, Maybe I think there's this also maybe a difference of perception of what nationalism is in Europe and in the U.S. And, uh, and Anatoly didn't mention it today, but yeah, of course he mentioned patriotism. But there's also this idea of civic uh, nationalism, not the, the, the ethno uh, nationalism, as you, as you were saying. But in our debates, normally these ideas of democracy, human rights and nationalism do not come together. Uh, or if they if they are put together, they are normally sometimes in opposition. So, but my, I mean, my first question is, how do you react to 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 Anatole's uh, proposal? And and um, yeah, please, Heather, it's great to have you with us. Thank you very much, and thank you so much for inviting me. It's it's really uh, great to comment on such an interesting and uh, such an interesting book, and to engage with Anatole again. Uh, he's written on so many different subjects, and and I'm very glad that he, like I, has come to the conclusion that after having worked on many other aspects of of policy and and current affairs, that climate change is actually the most important thing. And I think to underline something he said right in the middle that essentially many of the other, if not most of the other things we're currently worrying about become irrelevant when you consider the scale 
of um, of the d damage that that climate change is bound to to bring, even just on the current trajectory, um, let alone what could happen with regard to tipping points and feedback loops and so on. Um, so I'm definitely sold on that point. Um, I'd like to just give a couple of of points um, following on from uh, from Anatole's uh, approach, and also a couple of points of of disagreement with him, because it would be very sad if we all just agreed that that would be terribly boring. Um, and so and also to link a little bit to some of the work that Annika has been doing at EPC. So I think, first of all, it's a very welcome approach because we need to look a lot more at the politics of climate change. The debate about, um, about climate policy has tended to be, certainly in Brussels at EU level, really quite focused on the technical part, which is very, very important. But it's meant that the political communication and discussion um, at political level, I mean, I, here I don't mean the politicians, but politicians talking to voters about it has been woefully behind that. And it's really important to focus on how to maintain democratic consent through what will be a long and turbulent transition. That transition is absolutely needed and it's a system change. It's a change of our economies, a complete repricing of our economies. And it means a fundamental change in security paradigms in even what is a definition of security in a burning world. Um, and in order to get people there, there needs to be a very different kind of vocabulary and approach that we've seen. There's the need to prioritize climate, as, as Anatole said. Um, at the moment, it's still just one policy among many. Um, it's now discussed as a major priority in the European Union, which is good. This is a big change from just two, three years ago when it was all about jobs and growth. Um, but that hasn't that change hasn't happened in the United States for some of the reasons that Anatole mentioned. Um, and what's quite scary is that even in Europe, which is the first big mover as an advanced industrialized economy, it's still subject to all kinds of watering down of measures that need to be taken really quickly. And a lot of politicians who are still hoping that um, they, this is just going to be beyond, their, be beyond the, the, uh, their, their time frame. And time frames, I think, are one of the key problems and which relate also to what Anatole was saying about nationalism. The problem with climate change for the past 30 years has been that it always seemed to be beyond not just the next electoral cycle, not just the next election, but the next couple of elections. So no politician was going to risk their political career taking on, giving very unpopular messages to the public and proposing radical measures to something that seemed like it could be, you know, the next president but one's problem. And similarly, corporate profit um, cycles and reporting and, and the way in which the whole corporate governance system works, uh, accountability to shareholders and so on, also did not take into account um, something with such a long time horizon. It was about quarterly profits or annual results rather than thinking about five years ahead or 10 years ahead. And as a result, we're now reaching emergency point because neither the politics nor the economics has really fundamentally changed and it needs to change very rapidly. So it's very important to have a book like this that looks at um, a now uh, at least one and a half century, two century old concept of nationalism and how that can be brought in a positive frame, because we need to start thinking really seriously about how the politics of this are going to work. Otherwise, we will have gilets jaunes all over Europe, all over America and, and many parts of the world. So I just wanted to start with a couple of points and then I'll go into what I disagree with, but a couple of points of expansion on, on what Anatole was saying that particularly this question of the impact of climate change on security, which is deeply underestimated. And he rightly pointed to um, the uh, second order effects and particularly he pointed to migration, but it's actually broader even than that because um, environmental degradation really damages all systems and even to our understanding of security itself. Um, and we still see the way that uh, security threats are, are basically regarded as exogenous risks generated outside the EU and the US and other rich countries, rather than risks that the EU and US economic model and external policies have actually contributed to. You know, the EU's carbon emissions are only 8% of global carbon emissions. Sounds wonderful, pat on the back to the EU, and that's going to be reduced fit for 55 by 55%, marvellous. But the EU's embedded CO2 in the products and services that it imports, the demand that its hyper-consumer economy and overconsumption creates is massively bigger. It's a much bigger proportion. I mean, there are all kinds of estimates of it, but some people even say two thirds to, to three quarters. So it's really quite extraordinarily big. Um, and also with regard to security, and this comes to a fundamental uh, theme in Anatole's book, 
um, it's still very much dominated by national security frameworks. Now, the EU at least has a regionally coordinated approach. NATO has a regionally coordinated and transatlantic approach. But basically, you know, the defense establishments in each country are still thinking of what do what's, you know, here is our us inside and there's them over there. And they're focusing both on uh, too much on how do we defend within our borders um, and thinking about threats as being something that can be kept outside the borders. Um, so it's the sort of homeland security approach, which doesn't work with climate because there's only one climate. But also they're not taking account of the fact that decarbonization alone is not going to stop the erosion of ecosystems and the ecological disintegration that's already starting to come from the never expanding um, use of energy and resources really without limits. Um, and that's a big problem. Carbon emissions could stop tomorrow and we would still be facing ecological crises in a number of different parts of the world. Disruption to hydrological cycles um, and because of deforestation, these cause suffering, conflict, massive displacement of people. Just to give you a small example, um, if um, yes, and decarbonization of the global north could actually increase decarbon deforestation of the global south. Uh, so if you think about the forests of Central Africa, um, which are uh, basically responsible for the, the biophysics that feed the Nile, which of course provides water to millions of people, not just in Egypt, but also Uganda, to the Ethiopian highlands and so on. Um, what happens when those forests are dug up to provide the uh, lithium, cobalt, etc., the raw materials for electric vehicles and all the low carbon technologies that we want to bring in to decarbonize the global north. You know, you can create more disaster in other parts of the world through an ill thought out strategy, which is mostly focused just on creating nice clean cities in Europe and the United States. So it's really important that the European Green Deal, which is basically designed for the EU's internal transition and not from the rest of the world, stops treating internal impacts as add-ons to the core climate problem. Uh, policy, but really starts to see them as um, vital to the world system. And that includes security, because the other problem is that um, there is a, an extraordinary co-location of um, the deposits of minerals and other raw materials for low carbon technologies in highly fragile and conflict prone zones. So we could make things a good deal worse. So there needs to be a systems approach to ecological security that's not fragmented along national or even regional borders because neither ecological degradation nor its root causes stops at borders. And on this, I would just refer you to a publication that we did with uh, Carnegie Europe uh, with Richard Youngs and Olivia Lazar called The EU and Climate Security Towards Ecological Diplomacy, which sets out this wicked solution um, in more detail. So I'll just come on to um, a couple of, uh, yes, uh, very briefly, a couple of points where I, I would just disagree. A yep. line, <laughs> yeah, different line from, from Anatole, um, which is really um, about the, the question of um, Russia, Russia and China and also the language of sacrifice. So in Russia, China, I just note that disinformation will play a big role in the politics of climate change. And so let's not discount that, that the problems in the relationship with Russia are one thing, but Russian um, uh, interference in, in our democracies is also going to affect climate. I mean, look what's happening now with manipulation of gas prices and so on. Um, and also that Russia and China are not in the same position on climate. China is actually much more committed to action and has many more domestic drivers for effective climate action. Uh, whereas Russia is in a different story, again, it's completely different that we won't go into now, but we could go into later. And final point is just on sacrifice. I would be really careful about this because um, I think, I genuinely think that if we get this transition right, there doesn't have to be massive sacrifice for most of the population because um, individual behavioral change can happen to um, create some quite major, major changes in terms of, of our energy and, and also resource use, um, which doesn't mean an, a, a major sacrifice for individuals. It means some changes, but actually these can bring a better quality of life in terms of air quality, in terms of the, the building standards, um, also in mobility, not having to sit in traffic jams, not to, to, to face all of the pollution and so on. And Annika has done a lot of work on this at EPC, this question of 
individual behavioral change. What's needed is the social contract that Anatole referred to. It's the deal part of the European Green Deal, which is absolutely vital. So I wouldn't, I would never uh, off, uh, advise a politician to frame it as sacrifice. It's change. But I, re I also really think it's not hidden sacrifices. If the polluter pays and accountability sits where it should sit uh, in terms of corporate governance and in terms of the state, um, it's actually quite possible to make that uh, that shift without having a lot of wir müssen Opfer bringen um, as, the, as the mentality behind it. And then I'm happy to come along to the questions about which elements of nationalism might be helpful and which unhelpful in our okay. debate. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Heather, for, for your reflections and for, for, I mean, for looking at this also in a, in a, let's, in a constructive way, because I think there's a, a, also a lot of uh, temptation to look at, uh, at nationalism or national mobilization in a sort of in a negative uh, or with the, neg with the potential negative spillovers and you're looking at this okay how can we actually turn this into a positive and and you then referred uh, um, also to a lot of the work that Annika has, has been doing in about sort of individual uh, mobilization and, and I know that she's been also thinking a lot about 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 the sort of a plan on how to actually achieve the ambition the the, the, the green deal is really a very ambitious uh, um, a project the transition is a very ambitious ambitious uh, process and Annika has been thinking about the foundations for action and for actually getting this thing done so Annika I would invite you now to sort of to share your reflections I think maybe even on Anatole's and and Heather's uh, reflection so far thank you and welcome Yep. Thank you so much. I'm delighted to share some thoughts with the focus very much on Europe, the EU and its member states. And I would like to start by saying that I fully agree that nation states are essential actors in the transition. This transition can be accelerated or slowed down by member states. But uh, while I'll talk about some of the challenges, the gaps in action, I want to start by stressing that in the global comparison, the EU with its member states have taken a leadership role in promoting the climate agenda. And while the member states do not always agree on the measures to be taken, the fact that the member states recognize together that the European Green Deal is the new growth strategy, this is significant. The fact that member states have agreed to achieve climate neutrality and reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 55% by 2030, this sends a very important signal to the world where the EU is heading. But uh, taking the urgency, we know that this is just a start. And while there's still a long way to go, and that there is still a long way to go to implement these goals. And when we look at the EU, we see that the EU and its member states tend to be good in agreeing on visions and setting targets, but as well summarized in the European Environment Agency's State of the European Environment Report for 2020, our member states continuously fall behind when it comes to actually implementing the agreed climate, energy, and environmental goals. And there's a problematic discrepancy between the EU level ambition and member state action. And we desperately, urgently need countries to take ownership for this agenda, to push through many of the required changes in our energy, mobility, in our food systems, and how we produce and consume. And the bigger driver for this should be self-interest, recognizing that it's in the country's national interest to find effective ways to prevent, mitigate, and adapt to climate change within their borders and beyond. What bothers me in the discussions across EU member states is that the rhetoric is not enough on what the benefits are for individual EU member states, be it the economic, social, environmental security benefits. We barely hear our leaders talk about the cost of non-action. Rather, we see a lot of comparison on who does what. Uh, if our neighbors aren't doing more, uh, be it within the EU or beyond, why should we? Also, just to say, I'll be happy to come back to uh, climate change as a national security issue uh, in the discussion if there's time, but uh, more generally, recognizing that we're talking not about the potential, but about the real security threat that is already on our doorsteps with the enormous cost for humanity, for our societies, for our economies, already during our lifetime, as well as series of benefits in the form of new better jobs, business opportunities, cleaner air, better health, lower healthcare costs, better quality of living, and ultimately sustainable prosperity. If we recognize this context, we should be seeing a race to the top. Countries, regions, cities, businesses competing with solutions and trying to beat one another in this ultimate race for better lives and prosperity within the boundaries that the planet has given us. And if we recognize this context, we should see a change in the narrative that we tell ourselves to realize that change is possible. It's a must and it's our self-interest. And we should celebrate the successes that we see around us, the developments, 
that the solutions that are making our economy, society, and lives more sustainable. And thus, make this narrative, make it positive rather than um, a narrative of negative change. And if the EU and its member states can showcase the concrete economic, social, environmental security benefits that come from reducing, reducing emissions and greening the economy, and how this can be done cost effectively, I would say that they can play a re leading role in mobilizing also others to speed up their efforts, which is also in our self-interest. But as a second point, I think that it's worth to recognize that while nation states, states are essential actors, it's not just national governments, state institutions and electoral majorities that make the transition happen. In, many, in fact, many changes are happening even if not supported by member states. Many businesses and communities of businesses are driving change in our economies with the solutions they're bringing on the market. When international business screens its supply chains and operations, this can have a major impact. Even if the global EU, as well as national policy and financial frameworks at times sent contradictory signals, we see that many businesses have recognized that greater sustainability is the future. They need to be prepared for this, and it's in their interest to be part of the solution. It's also interesting to see how several European cities have already taken the power in their hands, um, of which good example is how they're accelerating greening of mobility by introducing limits and bans on diesel and petrol cars. They're doing it because many of the member states have been very slow to take seriously the problems with air pollution and transport emission across the EU. And even though some member, state, member states now may fight against a recent commission proposal to increase CO2 emission standards for vehicles and their efforts to accelerate uptake of clean vehicles, the cities have sent a clear message to automobile industry and their citizens what the future looks like. And of course, we shouldn't forget the citizens and consumers who can have a huge impact on the system. Basically with every purchasing decision people make, they send a signal to the market. A good example of this is food consumption. People's interest in sustainable food has skyrocketed over the years. And as a result, so has the range of organic, vegetarian, vegan products that the food industry puts on the market. And although, and this is in the European context, we see the EU, the member states, we have common agriculture policy, common fisheries policy, they continue to provide enormous subsidies for unsustainable food production and consumption, which keeps the prices of these products artificially low, even despite these discrepancies in action, the transition in the food system is already a reality. And lastly, uh, while the actual implementation happens within the EU member states, I do want to finish off by recognizing the role of the EU institutions in guiding, coordinating, incentivizing and enforcing action. Because the EU as a whole wouldn't be where it is today in addressing the climate, ecological pollution, waste and chemical crisis without EU collaboration, without coordination of efforts, without the agreed environmental climate goals and policies, without the diverse toolbox it has available, which is made of EU policies, economic and financial instruments, it's made of EU's convening power, which the EU can use, and obviously should use even more in a coherent manner to guide and incentivize member states in action. Of course, I recognize that if there is a real political will and ownership in the member states, this will make compliance and implementation of agreed goals and rules easier and much, much more effective and efficient. And yes, the EU should become much better at ensuring compliance, enforcement and penalizing member states when they are breaking agreed rules. But even when member states fail or are slow to implement EU's environmental and climate goals and policies. The EU targets together with the policy and economic framework provide essential framework and incentives for action. Mm. So I'll stop here um, and I said, if there's time, I'll be happy to reflect more on climate change as a national security issue, as well as on what is needed next if we're to get on the right track. Thank you. Thank you, Anika, for, for, for that. Uh... Uh, also for bringing the, I mean, the EU perspective and how the EU through its tools can actually then also push member states and, and countries to, to act, to actually to act. I think it was clear from the three presentations that um, both, I mean, within the EU, but globally, we are falling short of, um, of the challenge. And so I, I wanted to, first, I wanted to invite again our, our, our participants to, I think they're being a little bit shy today, but to, to write their questions uh, in the chat or, or to raise uh, their hands. But I want to just 
to really to to touch upon uh, this issue of of uh, nationalism and mo more of the mobilization. And I went to look at at the and looking more sort of at the EU at the EU level. And I I, I went to look at at the the spring uh, Eurobarometer. So the, I mean the field work was from June and July uh, 2021. Uh, on the the, the 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 two the two most important issues um, uh, facing the EU, so for you know for the respondents for European respondents, the two uh, major issues for the EU were economic situation and environment and climate change. So climate change has moved uh, from the from the winter Eurobarometer to the spring Eurobarometer again to to second position. Interestingly enough, within the countries, so when they asked what is the major the major the two major issues within your country. Uh, climate change drops to number five. So my question is that how do you read these results? Uh, um, and I mean, if, if the issue is about mobilization, clearly uh, people, okay, uh, there are four countries, you know, the uh, Denmark, the Netherlands, uh, the, you know, Germany and, and Belgium that actually um, uh, think that this is their major uh, problem within the country. But this is not, uh, I mean, this is not across across the whole, the whole um, uh, uh, EU. So, I mean, what is your reaction to these numbers in terms of the mobilization? How can, how can we mobilize uh, this uh, civil society to, to this? Um, Heather, you had raised your hand, but I don't know if, yeah, go ahead and then I'll, I'll bring Anatole and Annika, please. Well, I think this is an incredibly important point because there is a dangerous assumption among uh, politicians across Europe at the moment that relatively high levels of support for the general idea, the general principle of climate action, even radical climate action is high. That is true. In aggregate, it's high. And across the European Union, that's a good thing. But it's fragile. It's shallow. And it's very much segmented by age and across countries. So um, and that you need to dig further. But Eurobarometer just gives a, you know, the broad picture. Now, we've done research with uh, DPART, a democratic participation think tank in in uh, in Berlin and also with Counterpoint in Paris, um, looking in more detail at what's going on. And it's it's much more fragile than it looks. One thing is it's only really the under 25s who want seriously radical action. They don't own houses and cars yet. Um, and they also understand this is going to affect them in their lifetimes in not very far away. And they are prepared prepared to go for the whole way on Fit for 55 and beyond. But in other countries, uh, in other um, cohorts, in other people who are older, it's a very different story. They don't yet know. And because there hasn't been a social contract provided to them, they don't know what it means, for example, to give up the internal combustion engine. Does that mean I'll be able to afford an electric car? Will I be able to get to my workplace um, if there's no public transport available? This was at the heart of, of the Gilets Jaunes protest to begin with. Um, they're told energy transition, you've got to get out of, of fossil fuels. OK, but then where's the infrastructure for my me to connect my house to uh, an electric grid who's going to um, you know buy solar panels for me and, and my my neighborhood none of these things have been spelled out yet and it's very important the EU is taking these um, uh, measures with the fit for 55 with the renovation wave and so on as people start to see the benefits but there needs to be a lot more um, reaching people in the local communities, also through business, as Annika was saying, so that they see the way that they can live. There needs to be a vision of the future life in a carbon neutral or climate neutral um, economy and society and a sense of what it will actually be like. And so this is very different from 1989, when people were faced with a massive system change, the end of everything they'd known in terms of economy and politics. But they could peep over the Berlin Wall and see how people lived in a different system and imagine how they might live in that different system. And even if it didn't quite work out exactly like that, there was a sense of, oh yeah, oh look, there's prosperity, there's stability, there's security. Whereas now we have no model society that has made it to climate neutrality, which can provide that example. And that's where nationalism is quite tricky because it's easy for those who don't want to provide a vision or to decry the vision and be cynical about the vision to say, well, you know, you're gonna have to live like in China and, and live under authoritarianism because that's the only way you'll be able to get to, to, to the kind of measures that will be needed. Or um, the, um, you know, once you've started nationalism, uh, there's no on off button. It's very difficult to, to and so it's it's again very easy to start framing these things as external threats, as things that are being imposed upon you. This is imposed upon you by Brussels. Look at how the far right in France is using this in the French election campaign already. Look at how the AFD used that in the German election campaign. Look also at what Viktor Orban said yesterday uh, about this is yet another diktat from Brussels. Um, so I think there is a 
real danger that nationalism, particularly in Europe, um, in, and Anatole referred to how in the US, the sort of China rivalry is, is a form of nationalism that can be very damaging to climate action. In Europe, there's a real danger that it becomes another diktat from Brussels and must be resisted, rather than we are all heading towards a different future that could actually be a better quality of life. Uh, thank you, Heather. Uh, Anatole, your take. Uh, yes. Well, I agree that in future, I mean, the end state, if we can achieve it, of a low or zero carbon, you know, green economy, coupled, of course, with Green New Deal and social solidarity, uh, would be better for everybody. Uh, but um, the transition to that could be very bumpy indeed. Um, one thinks of the Industrial Revolution in the 19th century. The end result of the transition from, you know, very poor agricultural, semi-feudal European societies to modern European industrial societies ended up being better for, you know, of course, the overwhelming majority of populations. Um, <laughs> The process of the transition, of course, involved mass suffering, colossal disruption, um, revolutions, and arguably um, indirectly the First and Second World Wars as well. Um, and now, of course, I'm not saying that, pray God, it will be anything uh, you know, as, as bad as that. But um, it is very difficult for me, at least, to see uh, how we will be able to push peoples and economies in the direction we want them to go uh, without higher prices, um, you know, carbon taxing to drive up um, in one way or another uh, the price of fossil fuels. Uh, but as we see from the, um, the, the present uh, so far only potential gas crisis in Europe and the surge in prices, uh, in fact, whenever prices really, really go up, um, governments react with what? With new subsidies to bring prices down, rather than saying, great, this is exactly what we need in order to you know, help really push economies towards uh, abandonment of fossil fuels. The other point, of, of course, is that um, most unfortunately, uh, renewable or, well, uh, alternative energy, not renewable energy, is not yet in a position, in part for, of course, pure technological, you know, brutal physical reasons, uh, to uh, replace fully fossil fuels. Uh, and um, here, you know, if you take the German Greens in particular, but other Greens as well, um, part of the sacrifice, that, in my view, will have to be made, but, you know, David Wallace-Wells and others have made this point as well, is a certain very limited sacrifice of personal safety. Namely, um, you've got to stick with nuclear energy until... Uh, alternative energy is in a position uh, to take up the slack. Uh, a key reason why Germany is failing and failing badly to meet its uh, Paris Agreement commitments is this his panicky abandonment of nuclear energy uh, as a result of um, the Fukushima. Well, it wasn't actually a nuclear accident. It was an earthquake and a tsunami, and they don't have earthquakes and tsunamis in Germany. Um, you know, when I hear leading Greens in Germany talking about how, um, you know, there's been this terrible German sacrifice because you can't eat wild boar in certain parts of Germany. Um, although, uh, since I'm speaking to a, um, a, a, a Belgian and, and French audience, uh, apparently you'd need to eat as much wild boar as Obelix the Gaul in order to put yourself in serious danger. You know, one, one does have to recognize that here too, there is a certain you know, failure of seriousness uh, and a failure to assess comparative risks and a failure to sacrifice uh, amongst other things, also your inherited attitudes, um, you know, when, when it comes to meeting the challenge of climate change. So certainly I entirely agree with Heather, you know, we need to also focus people's attention on a, a, a very, you know, good end state. But and I, I wouldn't, you know, obviously, uh, you know, start out by exaggerating sacrifices, but I, I fear and I, I do think that, you know, well, the opinion polls that have been mentioned do indicate that 
without explaining to people how some sacrifices will be necessary, uh, you will in fact play into the hands of the climate change denial or opposition camp uh, who will uh, you, you know, exaggerate the sacrifices and use this as, uh, you know, as an argument um, against action. I mean, as far as nationalism is concerned, you know, and of course I'm deeply aware of the problem uh, in uh, across Europe, in terms of the mobilization of nationalism, you know, against climate change action, uh, but uh, you know, the the melancholy fact is that nationalism is there. Uh, of course, thank God, not as bad in, in most of Europe, at least sort of Western Europe, as it is in the United States. But um, it it is there, and it's not going to go away. And the question is how we can. Uh, if you like, um, you know, point it in a better direction uh, as far as climate change is concerned, but also uh, I would say more widely, uh, because of course my entire book is dedicated to, to, to precisely saying that um, the classical exogenous threats are not so grave. And something I say in the book and have said it again and again is, is that, you know, our security elites risk making the mistake of our forefathers before 1914, um, they thought that the greatest threat to their states and regimes were each other. You know, Russia, the greatest threat to Germany, Germany, the greatest threat to France and so forth. Of course, in fact, uh, the greatest threats were endogamous. They, they were threats stemming from uh, the tensions, the fissures, the sufferings of your internal problems of European populations, which the First World War released in the form of communism and Nazism with dreadful result. Thank you, Anatole. Uh, Annika, I don't know if you want to, to comment on this because there's already the shyness in the in the chat room is over. So there's already <laughs> quite there's already four uh, sort of re interesting questions that relate to some of the issues that we've touched upon. So I don't know if you want to to address uh, re respond to any of this or can I bring one of the questions that that relates to what was being said? Sure, I can try to group my answers together as well. Okay, very good. Okay, so I, I mean, I wanted to because there's a, uh, I mean, there's there's four questions. I'm going to try to take the the four of them, but this one is very much uh, linked to what you were saying uh, just a, a, a few minutes ago, um, uh, Anatole, which is, you know, mobilization of nationalism, but how? You know, how are you? How are we going to? John uh, John uh, Craigs is asking, how can you actually mobilize? Um, uh, nationalism to concretely convince people um, to make, you know, climate positive choices. Basically, it's, it's his question. How can we actually mobilize it? In, how can we operationalize this? Uh, well, I mean, draw, draw attention uh, to the uh, existential future threats, to the future existence of specific countries, you know, just focus people on that you know america wherever is not going to be around in 150 years if we continue on our existing trajectories uh, you know the, this is true of, of uh, america but as i say also of, i mean european democracies as well um you know the the in, this the entire idea of us representing democracy and human rights in the world, even if our states survive, they will not survive as democracies in the face of radical climate change. And our, our entire cultural identity and image will disappear. Uh, that's the first thing. But the second thing, I, I, in the uh, short to medium term, I, I, I'm afraid, and I regard this as objectively true, but um, it is also the biggest indirect uh, you know, the, the factor uh, on, on the, the right in Europe. I mean, it, we cannot afford to neglect the issue of migration. Um, if you look at, you know, what is ha happening in, in Western Africa, um, in Central America, potentially in South Asia as well. It, incidentally, you know, we, we always see this as, um, as a Western issue. Uh, the most savage anti-immigrant border in the world more than 1,100 people shot dead over the past decade is the Indian border against Bangladesh. Uh, because um, not just the, of course, Modi's hin Hindu nationalist government, but previous Congress governments as well, are acutely worried about Bangladeshi migration and are also acutely worried about the effects of climate change on Bangladesh. So migrate, you know, and, and once, you know, look, look at um, how people in South Africa, uh, other, you know, uh, other other places 
regard migration from their neighbors. This is not just a Western, a Western issue. Um, and it is the biggest indirect effect of climate change, I think, as far as we're concerned, in the short to medium term, that is to say within the next few decades. Thank you, Anatole. We'll come back to the issue of migration because there's a question also in the chat on migration, but I wanted to go to Annika, you know, concretely, how can we mobilize nationalism? I know what would be your take on, on this and then Hader, maybe she will, she will have uh, also want to contribute on this one, but uh, Annika, please. And yeah, I'll be happy to come back to the whole question around reaching people, um, because I think that there are several issues we need to do. If we recognize that this is the ultimate challenge, um, the ultimate threat to our society's economies, to our security. What we should be seeing is that we have that we have leadership that recognizes and communicates the urgency for action. And these leaders, they can be politicians, policymakers, media, heads of military, other opinion influences. And at least um, this is obviously the case for Europe, but obviously elsewhere as well. We need leaders that communicate very clearly what is the direction of travel, the costs of non-action, and the benefits of the green transition. And in the case of Europe, in the EU, we obviously there's so much more that still needs to be done to actually align the member state action with the set goals. We still have a lot of incoherences, uh, be it with the use of policies as well as the economic tools we use. So it's actually very easy to say, first of all, let's remove subsidies for harmful practices. Second, invest in the future we want. And uh, when we look at, for example, at the moment, there is a significant number, amount of public money that is being made available as part of the COVID recovery efforts. This is a real opportunity to invest in the transition and mm -hmm. leverage private support for this aim and actually help to address some of these challenges that we will have um, in getting to the tr transition and getting on the right track. And this social dimension is so important. It's in member states' interest to bring people along. And if we really are to achieve the agreed goals, we need to communicate and show the benefits that the measures taken will bring for people. We need dialogue. We need participatory efforts um, where we engage with the people. We understand what their fears and concerns are so that we can address them and that we manage the social impacts, especially on the most vulnerable. But And as a last element in here, we need to provide people with tools to engage in the transition. And also we need to find ways to encourage behavioral change. And here I would think that it's actually important to keep in mind that it's not only the state can be an influential messenger, it's good to keep in mind that behavioral scientists recognize that messengers, the influential messengers differ for different people. Parents can be more influenced by the concerns and fears of their children than the political statements of national leaders. In a similar way, consumer choices can be greatly influenced by one's peer group. So we need to keep this complexity in mind if we are to involve people. Um, and yes, I'll, I'll stop here, but uh, if there's time, still happy to come back on you, the Annika. security yeah. issues. Yeah, I'll, I'll come now. Heather, any point on, on this in terms of, of, of you know, how to operationalize uh, then uh, nationalism to make this happen? Yes, absolutely. And I can also come to one of the questions in the chat about, about the security threat um, related to this. So I think, first of all, we've got to be really careful about what kind of nationalism. I mean, there's the civic versus ethnic nationalism. But it's also about what whether you are putting people on a state of high alert in terms of threats. OK, so this nationalism in the sense of belonging um, and wanting to preserve national heritage, national culture, what we're proud of, what we love about our, our country and our culture. That's all very positive. Um, but the danger is that once you start um, talking about nationalism in terms of protecting national security against foreigners, against foreign threats, which is a lot of what's going on in the United States, one, then you start, a, you reinforce a mindset of high alert a sense of insecurity and fear of material deprivation. And you know what political psychology shows very clearly is once people are in that kind of fear mindset, they can think about nothing else. If they're afraid that um, the, the danger is, as Anatole was saying, is coming from outside, the danger is migrants coming from other countries, then they'll wanna build that wall. I mean, that was used rather successfully um, and to gain many votes in the United States. And so then you, can, you might get a short-term spike of solidarity, but only for the in-group and you reinforce the in-group, out-group separation that political psychologists say is absolutely key. And that lowers people's openness to others and their sense of solidarity globally. And there is only one climate. So it's really important that the frame used to describe it in terms of the national uh, nation state is about belonging and heritage, and especially 
It's about freedoms. Now, the freedoms agenda is at real risk of being hijacked by the AFD, who've been arguing that Annalena Baerbock wants to um, you know, take away Germans' freedoms. And that was fortunately struck down, that argument, by the German Constitutional Court, which in an extraordinary ruling earlier this year, said that the German climate law needed to be tougher, not weaker, because it was denying future generations of Germans their freedoms in order to preserve the freedoms of Germans now. So the cost of inaction, which Annika was, report, was referring to as you know, essential for politicians to address, needs to include this freedoms argument in a very um, positive way that for our nation, for our people, they will lack freedom if we don't take action in this way. Uh, it's not the hordes who are going to come and invade us who are the problem. It's, it is the climate itself. And that's where, to come to the security question that Kadri Tustin asked in, in the chat, as well. Um, it, this is about how security itself is understood, that, you know, climate is going to cause developments that uh, threaten everybody's freedoms. But if you can include economic and social rights as part of the concept of human security, if you could bring in the idea that security in, involves sustained and stable access to habitable space for everybody, then you, you make territorial security and borders less relevant because you consider a whole of society security with respect to climate. And that's where you've got to get to. You've got to get to this idea of, this is about meeting essential human needs um, and that's what our economic system and our economic policy needs to aim at. And that's also what security policy is about. If it's about us versus them, we get more than they do, um, win, lose, you know, totally zero sum, then it's really going to be a disaster to start on nationalism. It's a different kind of concept of nationalism that needs to go with a different concept of security. Uh, thank you, Heather, for those remarks and for bringing uh, Kadri's uh, Tastan's uh, question, which is that she's, she was saying that there is a lot of focus on on, on migration and not. But, but what are what are other security implications, uh, Annika? I know that you need to leave in two minutes, so I'll go to you first and then uh, move on to 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 Anatole. I mean, there were a lot of interesting questions uh, in the chat, but I think we, I mean we have basically four minutes to go. So, Annika. Yeah, I, I would like to just summarize. I think that when we're talking about the security dimension, I think there are two dimensions. And uh, this also builds on uh, what Anatole was saying. If countries fail to recognize the impacts of climate change on different parts of the world, they risk focusing on security threats that may not be actual risks at all. And the reality is that we're looking at military forces across the world already today, we see that they're increasingly needed to manage climate-induced catastrophes. We saw this um, in China over the summer, and uh, we are going to be seeing this increasingly across the world, where actually our military forces will be occupied to deal with climate related disasters. And it is this new enemy that will be keeping our military forces increasingly busy in managing floods, disaster relief, firefighting, dislocated populations, et cetera. So I think that that's, that, that's one dimension we need to keep in mind. The other one is that it's time to recognize that we are in a war. The war has started. We spent billions on buying hornets and investing in military to deter possible military threats and defend our, ourselves against worst case scenarios, no questions asked. But if we listen to science, we know that we are at the moment in a war against time, against climate change, ecological destruction. And this is not a traditional enemy. This is a shared enemy across the globe, which threatens our national and international security. And we need this recognition that we are in a war. There's this urgent to act. And unfortunately, this is not currently being reflected in the measures that are taken. Okay, thank you very much, Anika, for, for that, and also for being so forceful. I know that this is your passion as well, so it's always good that emotion is come, comes into policy debates as well, and that we really look at this from this perspective. Anatole, uh, I, I mean, Felix had also a really interesting question. It, it was also very nice because he was saying that the conversation is so good, that's, that's why there are no, no, you know, no, no questions. But he has also this issue about you know, international collaboration among countries that have national you know, values, national values that are different. So, I mean, the security element the aspect and also this other element of collaboration among different national identities and national values. No. Mm. Oh, first of all, I'd just like to say, since um, she has to go, thank you so much to Annika for, for taking part and also uh, I would also say for the, the, the passion uh, of your, your commitment to this issue, which of course I totally approve of and share. Um, on uh, 
security. I mean, a part of it is, you know, what, what has been called human security. I mean, I, I really think, you know, we need to focus um, our minds and the minds of our security establishments uh, on the fact that in the end, they are there to protect the lives and well-being of our citizens, you know, of people, and people are dying, uh, people are getting sick, people are losing their homes, people are being, you know, in, endangered already by the effects of climate change in our countries, you know, in a way that, um, you know, I mean, yes, of course, China and Russia pose certain kinds of threats, but, you know, it, it I mean, through uh, carbon gas emissions, sure. But I mean, on that, we are all guilty, right? But it isn't China and Russia, you know, which are desertifying the Mediterranean or creating wildfires or heat waves or any of these things. You know, it is, it is emissions, which we, we have to deal with. So human security uh, is some um, is one aspect. Uh, on the future role of the military, uh, yes, I mean, uh, I believe that the most Im important Western uh, military unit today uh, is, the Amer is the American Army Corps of Engineers, which, by the way, its traditional role has always been flood control and water management, and that is going to become more and more and more important. And I mean, in, in Europe, too, we need to think of, you know, rethink our militaries as disaster relief and disaster management organizations. And once again, not just um, for us, uh, but, you know, as we already see to an extent, but much, much more intensively and widely internationally as well, you know, just as we have um, sent out people uh, in a chaotic way, but with at least provisional success, you know, to, to confront Ebola uh, in Africa. So we need to think of, you know, how we can use our, our militaries who can after all be deployed quickly and in a, a disciplined fashion, but much more intensively in the area of, of disaster relief and climate resilience elsewhere in the world. Uh, but, you know, when it comes to migration and walls, look, I mean, it's no good saying that climate change threatens, you know, ecological catastrophe, social meltdown, state failure and civil war across large parts of the world, and then saying, oh, but migration isn't really an issue. It is an issue. Um, and there are going to be higher and higher walls. Um, there, is there is no question about that. The point, though, is that, of course, this has to be combined with uh, much, much more intensive uh, efforts to help and strengthen key areas of the world. But in order to do that, look, I mean, let's face it. I mean, America is particularly bad. Uh, but uh, European aid efforts, um, uh, you know, I, I've been closely involved in this in South Asia, uh, but um, in Western Africa as well, compared to the scale of the problems, are pitiful. I mean, simply pitiful. And yet you see deep public unwillingness uh, significantly to increase these efforts. Uh, so I mean, I'm afraid once again, to, to, to get people really, really to increase aid. Uh, development aid, resilience aid uh, to parts of the world, you've got to convince them that these parts of the world are, are indirectly also a threat to them. I mean, I know this, you know, th this is an unpopular line, and it's one I came to myself um, unwillingly, uh, but I'm afraid, you know, I mean, once again, it's particularly true of America, but look at the sums, that look at the taxes that people are prepared to pay uh, for Western militaries, which to a very considerable extent have no useful purpose whatsoever in you know, many sectors. Uh, and then look at the um, sacrifices which so far they've been prepared to make either for uh, international aid or the struggle against climate change. I'm afraid that threat perception, like it or not, is simply a prime mover of human effort. Uh, and once again, the, the, the task must be to convince people that climate change really is a threat. Once again, not just to the planet, it is, to humanity, it is, but to, to them and their children. Uh, thank you, Anatole, for, for that uh, last reflection. 
uh, listen, I think we could, you know, easily say for another hour, sort of just unpacking all of the ideas and all of of of, of the issues that that you and but also Heather and Annika brought uh, to the table. I mean, uh, last two points on on my side. First, an apology to all the participants to whose question I was not able to to bring into to the discussion. Uh, thank you for participating and for for being there. And uh, I mean, finally, it remains for me to thank you both uh, and Annika as well. Annika has uh, had to leave, but to thank you, Heather, and thank you, Anatole, for, for bringing it's such an interesting uh, discussion. I think we're going to have more of this, but clearly today was really a stellar, a stellar, uh, you know, seven, now 80 minutes of, of, of conversation about what will be I'm, I'm a life changing transition, I think, for, for all of us. So I hope that we are, you know, up to the task and, and that in a few years we will be able to look back and say that, you know, we, we, we are able to mobilize people through whatever methods were there to, to, to mobilize them and and to tackle this uh, this challenge so again thank you very much for taking the time to spend you know these 80 minutes with us both uh, uh, Annika Adder and, and you Anatole but also all the participants and thank you also for the uh, you know uh, King Budwa Foundation and for all the colleagues that 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 made this uh, this uh, this seminar today possible thank you very much and have a thank good you. evening it was a, bye it bye was a great pleasure and thank, thank you Heather.